and then we put them there we go um, and what that means is that um, we can then put it up on our YouTube channel and people who are un unable to join us this evening can look at it if they wish. So it, 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 it enables the whole thing to be more inclusive than it would otherwise be. So I hope that's okay. Um, but just please bear that in mind if you don't like being recorded. Um, so my name is Andrew Thin. I'm chairman of the Scottish Land Commission, have been since we started actually in 2017. Um, I also, um, at the moment, I'm chairman of Scottish Canals, which isn't hugely relevant to Orkney. Um, but in past lives, uh, well, actually, I used to live in Thursday and look across in Orkney um, for many years, but um, in past lives, I've been to Orkney many times. So really nice to, to be able to have a public meeting that's dedicated to people in Orkney. I'm so sorry that we couldn't come. I, I, um, I love going to Orkney, and I would have much rather been holding this in a, in a, in a hall in Stromness or somewhere, but... There we are. That's the life. That's life at the moment. I'm going to ask the others, uh, the other members of the panel who are with me, to introduce themselves before we go any further. So, Megan, can I turn to you, please? You need to unmute as you go. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm having slight technical problems at this end. Um, I'm Megan. I'm one of the land commissioners. Um, I will be giving a short presentation at the beginning of this present of this webinar. I um, I grew up on the Isle of Skye, and then I went and lived overseas, worked on land reform internationally for a long time. But now I'm back living up in the West Highlands in Applecross this time, looking across the water to Skye. But it's great to be here, and likewise. I wish I was also in Orkney on the islands myself this evening, but we'll have to make do with what we have at the moment. Thanks. Thanks, Megan. And then uh, David Adams. Um, so this is not in any particular order except the order of my screen. David, over to you. Thanks, Andrew. I'm David Adams. I'm one of the other uh, land commissioners. The, the land commissioner's uh, role is part time, um, and uh, we have a, a, an excellent full time staff. Um, I'm based in Scottish Borders. I'm uh, Emeritus Professor at the University of Glasgow, which basically means I'm a retired academic. Um, I have many happy memories of Orkney because I used to be external examiner at the International Centre for Island Technology in Stromness, so, so came regularly to Orkney. And, and unlike the others, it would have been nice if we could have gathered, but hopefully we will have uh, as, as much interaction um, virtually tonight, uh, as we would have done in a hall. David, thanks very much indeed. Uh, and Gemma, Gemma Campbell. Hi, I'm Gemma Campbell. I'm the Land Rights and Responsibilities Manager, and I work um, for the Commission. I'm based in Inverness, but originally from South Uist. Uh, I've been with the Commission for about two and a half years now. Gemma, thank you so much, and, and thank you all of you for joining us. Um, now, um, before the pandemic, oh, oh, sorry, I should also say that behind the scenes is Posey McRae. P Posey, because I couldn't see you, I nearly forgot, I apologise. Um, so behind the scenes is Posey McRae, and she's managing all the technology, and she's going to be putting up uh, information and links on the chat function as we go along. So I hope that, oh, she said hi in the chat function, there you are. So if you open your chat box, click on that thing that says chat, and you've got a box, then you'll be able to see things that she's putting up. Um, so thank you, Posey. Um, now, before the pandemic, of course, we, we held public meetings, and, and it's one of, of our signatures, if you like, the Land Commission's signatures, that we hold, we hold public meetings every month around the country, and we have since we began. And the public meetings have shaped the things that we've worked on, they've shaped the decisions about what we should work on, because land reform is a huge subject, we can't do it all at once. Um, so they are and continue to be hugely important. Um, We've now migrated the whole thing online. It's actually working quite well. Um, it does allow some people to participate who might find it difficult otherwise. So in that sense, it's positive. In another sense, it isn't quite the same as talking to people in, in a village hall. Um, and it certainly makes it very difficult for people to talk to me privately. So I'll come back to that at the end uh, on, uh, if you want to. But it's worked, it's worked well, and um, we do this, and we do it every month, because first of all, I think it's really important that a public body like this explains to the people of Scotland, the voters, the taxpayers of Scotland, what we do, so you know, because we, we are ultimately public servants. Um, so we're here to explain what we do, um, 
We're here to listen to your priorities. I think that's also hugely important. Scotland's a very diverse country and the priorities that we find in Dumfries and Galloway are not the same as Orkney. Um, so we need to get around and listen to people. So we're here to listen to your priorities and that will help shape what we do. Our work, we're a national, we're very small, we've only got about a dozen staff. We're a national body and we're an advisor to government, but we can't do that if we don't understand the diversity of priorities around Scotland. So that's the second reason. And the third reason is a very simple one, which I, I, I feel strongly about, which is we're here to be held to account. So please hold us to account. If you think we're getting it wrong, tell us. If we think you think we're getting it right, tell us. And um, please do, please <laughs> tell us both if you think <laughs> some things are right and some things are wrong. But we're here to be held to account, and I do think that's important. So please take take the chance. The process for these public meetings, um, we will finish no later than 8:30. I'll give you that guarantee so you know what, what the, how, how the timings will go. And um, we'll have a presentation from Megan, and Megan um will take, I don't know, 15 minutes or so. We'll see how that goes. Um, she's got a lot of slides and, and a lot of information to impart in a short time. I don't envy her, but she's very good at it. So we'll get, we'll, we'll hear from her. And that's that's really a skate through all what, what we do and what, we, what, what, what we've done so far in the short time we've existed. And then I will then open it, open it up. And what I want to have is a conversation with all of you. There's now um, 31 participants in total. I want to try and have a conversation with you. I want to hear what you think, what you think the priorities should be. Please ask us questions if you like. We will endeavor to respond. In order to do that, there's two things you can do. There's a, a, a chat button that just says chat. There's a wee bubble. If you click on that, you can type into the chat. So you can type in anything you like, your thoughts, your views, um, just anything, anything you wish. Uh, and that's, that works pretty well for a lot of people, we find. In fact, the first couple of meetings, we just used that alone and it worked really nicely. But we are also now, um, we've been trialing and it's worked pretty well too, using the raise hand function as well. So if you want to speak and ask a specific question or make a specific observation that you don't really want to put in the chat box for whatever reason, but would rather speak, and lots of us do prefer to speak, then please click on that raise hand thing and I will then be able to see that you're trying to get in and I'll be able to bring you bring you in. Um, so that's how it will work. Um, I'll try to manage the discussion so we do cover the ground because there's lots of different things and, and I'll try, you know, forgive me in advance if I push you down a wee bit, but we, we don't want one subject to dominate. You know, different people will want to talk about different things. Farmers will want to perhaps to talk about farming, but others will want to talk about housing or community ownership or whatever. So we'll try and get around the whole subject and make sure we've had a reasonably balanced meeting. I think that's enough really from me. Um, so I'm now going to hand over to Megan uh, and Megan's going to take us on a quick gallop through the extraordinary range of stuff that we're involved in at the moment. Megan, over to you. Thank you, Andrew. And Let's see if I can get this to work. There we go. So thanks, Andrew. And yes, yeah, so I'm going to spend about 15 minutes just giving a brief introduction to who the Scottish Land Commission are and what it is we're up to. So we have been tasked with driving forward land reform. But well, what is land reform and why does it matter anyway? So I like to start answering that question by um, basing it on some real examples of land reform. So I've chosen two <clears throat> for this evening, excuse me. The, 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 the photo at the top, I hope you'll recognise, is the sound of Rousset, because I wanted to speak about the work of the Rousset, Eglise and Wire Development Trust. So I'm sure many of you are very familiar with the Trust's work. They were established back in 2006 um, with a range of whole, uh, with, a, with a view to develop a whole range of different community development projects, many of which are focused on changing the, the, the use and purpose and productivity of land and assets around them. They've developed a 900 kilowatt community owned wind turbine, they've developed community gardens and just over a year ago they took on ownership of the 1700 acre Trumland estate with the idea of developing renewables, environmental, social and also <clears throat> um, heritage focused activities on the estate. The photo at the bottom is the um, um, it's a social bike village, sorry, down in Edinburgh. And you might be wondering why I've chosen this example down in Edinburgh and what, what on earth it has to do with the Orkney Islands. But the reason I've chosen this, this example is because it's a really good example of land reform that has two different 
two different outcomes and is very successful. The Social Bike Village, on the one hand, provides good quality of affordable housing for folk who are homeless or who are in temporary accommodation and a wide range of skills and, and support structures which can help them get back on their feet and become more independent. But on the other hand, the site has been developed on a previously vacant area of land outside Edinburgh. And this is, I think, quite relevant in terms of what the situation facing some areas across the Orkney Islands where there is a real need for affordable housing, but you've also got a large number, at least a number of brownfield sites which could be put to more productive use. So I wanted to choose these two examples and I could have chosen any number from across Scotland which demonstrate the, the continued importance and urgency of land reform and why it's so important for Scotland's future. Because land reform can help transform a, a, a vacant or derelict site which is a blight on a local community into a site which is productive, whether that's for environmental, social or economic purposes. It can help enable local families to access good quality, affordable homes in the places they want to live rather than having to move away. And it also helps to support the agricultural sector and farmers to be more, more successful and productive. And it also helps to ensure that people who own large areas of land in a particular location are not able to make decisions about that land without considering the negative impacts those decisions might have on local communities. So for us at the Land Commission, we see land reform really as a core part of the package which, of things which are needed across Scotland to make sure that communities are places that people want, want to live in and can live in and can find work in as well. And land reform is also part of the, our response to much bigger public policy challenges such as the economic recovery and renewal after the pandemic, responding to the climate emergency and the need to build resilient communities. And it's for all of these, these reasons that the Land Commission feels so passionately about the importance of what we're doing and I'm hoping I will be able to uh, infect you with that feeling of passion as well during the presentation and this evening. So who are we? Well, the Land Commission was established in 2017 by the Scottish Parliament, and it's one of the outcomes from the 2016 Land Reform Act. We are five land commissioners, so there's myself and David and Andrew here tonight, and we have one tenant farming commissioner, Dr Bob McIntosh as well, and as Andrew said, we're supported by a small team of staff who, the pre-pandemic, were based out of our office in, in Inverness. So we've been tasked with the government to provide advice and, and leadership around a programme of land reform. And that's not just looking at urban areas, it's also looking at rural areas. And it's looking at both the kind of changes which are needed in terms of legislation and policy in the long term, as well as the, the more immediate changes in behaviour and practice that can make a real difference on the ground. <clears throat> now we are what's known as an NDP, NDPB, which is non-departmental public body, which means we're not politicians. We are an arm's length body, public body, which helps to advise the government. And I also want you to bear in mind as I go through this presentation that we are the Land Commission. And although land intersects with a whole load of other issues and, and problems and policy areas, we're not the Planning Commission, we're not the Housing Commission, we're not the Transport Commission or the Heritage Commission. So um, please try and make sure that we, we, we kind of stick to the topic of land, although I, we all accept that it intersects with so many other areas of important policy. So before I get into the detail of our work, I just want to um, talk a little bit about a, another change that was introduced by the 2016 Land Reform Act, which has fundamentally changed the direction of land reform and also underpins everything we are doing and all our advice to government and other stakeholders. And that's the change in terms of how land reform is seen in, in relation to human rights. Prior to the 2016 Act, when we talked about land reform and human rights, we generally talked about the protection of private property rights being a, a hinder, a hindrance or a limitation on the progress of land reform. But with the 2016 Act, Scotland has moved in line with most of the rest of the world in recognising that um, human rights can be a springboard for achieving land reform and that land reform can help to progress the achievement and the realisation of human rights. This all might sound quite airy-fairy, but what, the way in which this is articulated most clearly within government, Scottish government policy is within the Land Rights and Responsibilities Statement, which is a statement, it's got a six principles, and it, it's unique in the world in terms of articulating that along with rights to land come, come responsibilities. Responsibilities not just to your local community and your neighbours, but also responsibilities to make sure that the land you own and are responsible for is delivering 
for the public good. So it's this rebalancing of the relationship between land reform and human rights, which really underpins everything that we are trying to do. So what are we doing? Well, we are about halfway through our second three year strategic plan. And as Andrew said, all of this information is available on our website, all the different pieces of work I will speak about are there. And as I go through, Posey will be popping up links into the chat box of the various different, of various different pieces. So please save those links and get that information for future reference. So this three year strategic plan has three work streams. The first is reforming land rights. The second is responsible land ownership in use. And the third is reforming land markets. And I'm going to speak just for a few minutes about each of these. <clears throat> so we recognize that the way in which we own and use land in Scotland has an impact on the distribution of power and wealth and resources and benefits across the country. So if we want to support the achievement of broader government objectives, for example, tackling inequality and responding to the climate emergency, we need to reform and rethink that system of underlying land rights. So we're doing this in, an, in a number of ways. We are undertaking work to encourage a more diverse pattern of land ownership. And at the moment, that work is focusing on changes that can be made to the tax and fiscal frameworks. We're also identifying new governance models, which can widen the range of people who are able to benefit from land. In Scotland, we tend to think about land ownership being either public or private, or by NGOs or by communities. Um, whereas across Scotland, it's actually much more common to find a combination of these entities who are able to um, own and co-manage the same piece of land. So we're looking at different models and which of those models could be beneficial for the Scottish situation. And as I said already, we're continuing to do some work that is rebalancing how we think about the protection of private property rights and the realization of the broader human rights which are relating to land, or what are known as the economic, social and cultural rights. Another key piece of work within this work stream has been what we've been doing to address the impact of concentrated land ownership. So back in 2018, we were asked by the government to look in to do some research to, to better understand the impact of Scotland's uniquely concentrated pattern of land ownership. And in the spring of 2019, we published the results of that, of that research and made some recommendations to ministers, which focused in on the issue of monopoly land ownership and also the monopoly of ownership of, of the control over land and the decision making around that piece of land. And the, our recommendations focused in on the need for a, a test of the public interest in future large scale land transfers. And we've seen from the recent um, agreement between the SNP and the Scottish Green Party that they are the, the, the upcoming land reform bill within this parliament, which is due, I think, to be public in 2023, will be focused in on, on tackling this issue. So I think we, we should expect to see this kind of continue to be discussed in public and over the next couple of years. The second of our work stream is around responsible land ownership and use. And this is aimed at improve, in ensuring that whoever owns and manages a piece of land, that they're doing it in a way which is more responsible both to local community and their neighbors, but also in terms of delivering greater public benefit. This work stream focuses in on supporting landowners of all different types and local communities in the implementation of that, that human rights related policy I already mentioned, the land rights and responsibilities statement. And we're doing this through what we call our good practice program. And Gemma is part of the team that implements that. So I'm really glad that she'll be able to be joining us in terms of answering questions uh, about that work. We've published so far eight different protocols, which help provide additional information about, about on the sorry additional information on the implementation of the land rights and responsibility statement. And we are we're also um, been, I think in the last twelve months we've worked with over one hundred and fifty different landowners and different community groups to do this on the ground. As this work develops in the next few months, we're going to be extending it to look at how. Um, local authorities and public bodies and the private sector can operationalize this land rights and responsibilities statement within their own management systems. And we're also at the moment advising the government on how the land rights and responsibilities statement can, can be reviewed in the next six months, as well as on additional two additional land related policies. One is the land use strategy and the other is the guidance on community engagement in land use decision making. So the third of our work stream is reforming land markets. 
Now, since we were established back in 2017, one of the key things we've been trying to um, better understand and, and focus our recommendations on is how our land markets across Scotland can operate more effectively. What I mean by this is the fact that our, our land markets are clearly not operating very effectively at the moment, because on the one hand, we have significant areas of land which is vacant and derelict. But on the other hand, in, in other parts of Scotland, we have a desperate need for land for affordable housing. And we need to find a market system which works more effectively in terms of delivering better outcomes from those pieces of land. <clears throat> One of the first um, pieces of work we did within this work stream was to try and tackle the problem of vacant and derelict land. So sites like the area that the Social Bike Village was built upon, there are more than 11,000 hectares of land across Scotland, which are currently vacant and derelict. So that's about three and a half thousand different sites. Um, there are, for example, four, four sites on the Scottish Government Register of vacant and derelict sites in, within the Orkney Islands, totaling around 40 hectares. Now, this is a problem which disproportionately affects our most deprived communities, and that, that figure of 11,000 hectares has pretty much remained the same since the 1990s. It's a really entrenched problem. And it's not just a, these, these sites don't just act as a blight on the local community, they're also a missed opportunity in terms of how this land could be used more productively. So together with the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency, we launched the Vacant and Derelict Land Task Force, which has brought national attention to the issue and has made a series of recommendations about how this land could be used more productively. The task force's work has now finished, but some of the recommendations are being taken forward by government at the national level, some are being taken forward by local government and other stakeholders, and some of the areas um, we are still working on as well within our own work streams. Another significant piece of work under this work stream has been looking, as I has been our work, trying to understand the, the way in which land is being made available for housing, both in rural and urban areas, and what can be done to make sure that we're able to create homes for people in places that they want to live in at prices they can afford. And our overriding research that was published at, uh, I think a month ago, which is, is sort of the culmination of two years research and analysis and stakeholder engagement. The overarching conclusion is that the current market led model is simply not delivering. And instead what we need is much greater public sector leadership in the provision of houses. Now this is both in, ur in, in more urban and peri-urban areas where housing development happens at scale, as well as in remote rural areas like, like my own community in Applecross where one or two or three houses can really make a real difference in terms of this, this sort of the issue around affordable housing to a, to a very small local community. So we've published a series of recommendations to ministers and our recommendations are aimed at not just simply addressing the, the issue of affordable housing in terms of land availability, but doing that in a way which achieves wider government objectives, for example, town centre regeneration and rural um, addressing rural depopulation. And our recommendations are also in line with the government's um, new 3.2 billion fund for affordable housing and the 100,000 affordable home targets for 2032. So we have five recommendations here. The first is for a new fund to create a network of place pioneers which can focus on delivering housing where the land is already owned by public bodies. The second is around em empowering local authorities to designate what we call regeneration partnership zones where, the, um, where we have problems of fragmented land ownership, which are preventing the, the delivery of housing. We're also introducing, recommending introducing new approaches to land value capture, as well as a new public land agency. And then finally, we are recommending a new transparency obligation on options and other kinds of conditions which are put on land, which are preventing those lands, those sites being, being uh, developed for housing. So, Last but absolutely not least, I want to talk about the work of the Tenant Farming Commissioner, Dr. Bob McIntosh, who's got a statutory responsibility to help to improve relations between landowners and tenant farmers. So Bob and the team have got um, have been um, publishing a series of codes of practice and other guidance, and then they often respond to alleged breaches of those codes. And increasingly, they're helping to arrange mediation as a means of resolving uh, issues or, or questions or disputes at the local level between tenant farmers and landowners rather than parties resorting to legal routes which can be really expensive and very time consuming. 
And then in addition to this sort of relationship building work, Bob and the team have also been doing a lot of work supporting new entrants. For example, we co-launched the land matching service a couple of years ago with the Farm Advisory Service and the Scottish Government. And um, we've also been working with a lot of different tenant farmers on succession planning. So before I finish, I just want to tell you about a new campaign we've just launched called My Land. And this is a new hub where you can learn more about how individuals and organisations have made changes to the land around them and as a result have really transformed their communities. If we have podcasts, we have case studies, we have loads of information. The purpose of this, of this new platform is to try and move away from land reform being seen as really geeky or technical and complicated and just demonstrate how transformative it can be and is being on, on different communities across Scotland and how it is something that absolutely every single community could actually get involved in. So please come and join the conversation. We'd really like to be able to add some stories and case studies from the Orkney Islands and the north of Scotland in general, because it is quite central belt focused at the moment. And um, it would be fantastic if you could come and yeah, have a look. We're on Facebook and Twitter and other forms of social media. And there's also a website as well. So thank you very much. I'm going to hand back to Andrew now. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your comments and your questions. Thank you. Megan, thank you very much indeed. So that was, as I promised you, a gallop, and it had to be a gallop, um, because in the short time we've been around, we've we've found ourselves tackling a huge number of issues and lots and lots of people telling us what they want us to do. So um, inevitably, that's been a relatively superficial gallop, um, and that's fine because it's really it's really for you to tell us what you would like to know more about, and we'll try and we'll try and answer. So. Um, what I'm really looking for now in this discussion, and we've got an hour, is so you know which bits of that interest you? Would you like to know more about any of it? In which case, we'll try and answer some questions. So that's that's point one. Point two: um, uh, What are your priorities? Does that link to, to your priorities in any way? And, and where does it not link? You know, where are we missing? Um, and and point three, I think. It, I think it's just really interesting to hear from people about your own thoughts on land reform, which is, which is partly, of course, you know, what are your priorities, but it's also just more, more generally, it's, it, it is a massive subject with a long, long history. We've had land reform for centuries in Scotland, and we will go on having land reform because for centuries because that's how the law keeps up with, with, with society as society evolves and modernises. So land reform will, will always be here. The Land Commission has been set up to try and enable government to do it in a, in a well-researched, evidence-based, sensible way. Um, and, and, and so that's why so much of this is, is, is really quite, de quite, quite detailed. The other thing that I just want to flag for you, it is a huge area of work, which Gemma in particular is very much at the forefront of, um, that we're involved in, which is just simply helping people, helping community groups, helping landowners, and, and, and so on and so forth, just helping people get the, make the best of things with best practice guides and all this sort of thing. So we can talk about all that as well. Now, we can talk about this in two ways. There's a chat button. Please, please use the chat function. All you need to do is just click on that button um, and then you just type into it and I'll pick, I'll, I'll pick stuff up from that. Or if you click on the yellow hand where it says raise hand, I should be able to see you. And I'll then invite you to contribute verbally. And when, when I do so, um, you'll need to unmute, of course. Um, so there we go. Have a wee think about what you want to, to, to contribute uh, and chip in. Um, and while you're doing that, I'm just going to, because we had one or two emails and things before the meeting, I'm just going to kick this off with, with some stuff that was already sent into us while you're having a wee think. But please just get stuck into the chat or whatever as, as I'm talking. Um, so the... The, the, the first thing, and I, may, I think I'm maybe going to come to you, Gemma, if that's all right. The first thing that was flagged um, to us before the meeting was whether land reform was just about public, uh, just about private landowners. And what about public sector landowners like Historic Environment Scotland or Orkney Islands Council? Or what about charitable landowners like the RSPB, another big player in Orkney? Um, and we've done a huge amount of... of um, of, of work uh, with, with the good practice guides and so on, try, trying to help people um, 
get things right. So Gemma, just some thoughts on that, um, on the good practice work, but also also on, you know, this is not just about private landowners and, and really any, any thoughts around some of that, just to kick us off, please. Yeah, um, I absolutely agree. It's not just about private landowners and we've been doing lots and lots of work um, with, with public bodies for the last few years, but um, particularly this year, um, some of some of the really active stuff we've got going on at the moment is we're working with um, with a range of public bodies to develop some guidance on community wealth building. We're looking at a kind of community wealth building approach to managing your land and assets. Um, we've been doing work with the Scottish government. We recently spoke to um, a, a lot of relevant authorities who are the bodies that you can submit a community asset transfer to. So we, we've done some work with them. Um, we have been working with landowners to carry out self-assessments, um, and that includes public bodies looking at, and, and RSPB as well, um, looking at how they manage their land, what they could do better, where there's good practice that they could share or expand on. Um, so it is something we're aware it, it applies to all landowners and managers, whether they're public or private, um, and we are always um, yeah, happy to help people um, with their processes, with their strategies and policies and the things they're developing. Thanks, Gemma. So I've got a couple of questions. So I'm going to start. So one from Fiona Graham, I'll come to second, if I may, Fiona, because William Anno has got his hand up. So I'm going to go to William first. I can't see your face, William. I can see a white box. I'm not quite sure why, but no yeah, matter, I'm sure we'll hear you. <laughs> yeah, hi, my name's uh, William Anno. Um, so yeah, thank, thanks for taking the time to come and speak to us today, it's, it's greatly appreciated considering all the, all the work you're doing. Um, and the, the, the goals and aspirations of what you're doing seem you know, fantastic. Um, affordable housing is something that's quite close to my heart. Um, on, on the subject of land ownership, um, does the commission appreciate the historical and cultural differences in land ownership in Orkney compared to that of, of Scotland? And, and if not, are you, are you interested? <laughs> Great. So, I mean, the short answer is we, we understand them a bit, but probably not a huge amount. But I'm going to come to David. David, do you want to offer some thoughts on the, the, the wide, I mean, the general point, which is that right across Scotland, there are different origins. Orkney is a very good example, actually. But of course, you know, right across Scotland, we've got different historical roots and uh, to, to land ownership patterns and land ownership. Uh, we've, we've got the Crofton counties only in parts of Scotland, for example. Some thoughts on that, David? David, you're muted. You're muted, David. Um, I'm muted. Um, we're under strict instructions to keep ourselves muted and then you, you forget. Um, yeah, I was going to say that's, that's uh, I think, very, very interesting. And, and I think it'd be useful just to explore this a bit further and uh, maybe have a little bit more information on the particular aspects that, that, that you think are, are, are most relevant to land reform. But if there's two... There's two areas um, that are worth thinking about. One is what you might call sort of the, the statutes, the legal processes, uh, the institutions, the formal um, aspects of land reform. And that, that is something that um, we are thinking about and we're working on. So for example, one of the uh, proposals that we've come up with that would apply, and I'm sure it would apply uh, of, of equal relevance in the Orkney Islands as the rest of Scotland, but please correct me if I'm mistaken, um, is a proposal which is called compulsory sale orders. And they are uh, intended to ensure that, that land and uh, buildings that are, that are left vacant or derelict over a long period of time um, are brought to the market and, and, and are sold to someone who can, who can actually make use of them. Um, and that would require a change in the law. Um, but the other aspect of our work, which I think is equally applicable, whatever the system of law and, 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 and policy and, legi and, and legislation, is around culture, around land owning strategies, about behaviour, um, and whether in fact landowners, those who own land, those who use land, are, are, are operating in a cooperative way, a supportive way, or whether actually they're part of the problem. Um, so I think 
maybe the second is more generic in Scotland, and maybe the first we need to be a little more cognizant of the particular differences, only. And, and I would sort of welcome more of a discussion of what those differences are that, that people think we, we, we ought to take note of. Thank you, Andrew. William, I'm going to come back to you because. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, oddly, your question does link quite nicely to Fiona's question about island impact assessments, because it, it is absolutely the case that you know, we'll produce advice and we're producing advice for the Scottish government or the Scottish parliament. Um, and then, then they have to turn that into something that works, legislation or policy, and, and it has to work for a pretty diverse country. Just, just tell us a wee bit more, William, about what's, what's behind your question, and what's bothering you. Um... Uh, so, uh, so kind of the, the basis of what um, I'm kind of getting at is that, you know, for, for the most part, um, Arcadians were not subjected to the Highland clearances. If you if you exclude Rousey uh, and a couple of other incidents, so Rousey in the 1840s, um, uh, is that the lands were were owned outright by the Arcadians under under Eudel tenure. So there's a different legal structure behind the land ownership. Um, the lands were then removed from the hands of the islanders uh, via by the Scottish Earls from the 1500s on to the 1900s. Um, and then it was at that point after after World War One, when when the Earls were needing money, they then sold the lands back to the islanders. So they, there's this there's this kind of different relationship between the land um, and Arcadians as to what tenant farmers who are burned up their homes in Scotland have, uh, where you have very long uh, sorry, very large estates in Orkney. We don't really have estates of the same size, and and the sort of the, the next point is that um, is that the majority of the land is is already owned by the community in Orkney. So that's that's kind of a fundamental difference there, and it's a and it's a cultural difference, and it's how we how we look on the land and our relationship to it. Thanks, William. Um, so. Um, First of all, very aware of that, which is partly why I was very keen that we had a public meeting in Orkney because it is different. Um, but secondly, it does link to the island's impacts question from Fiona. So thanks, Fiona, from Fiona Graham. Um, so we did carry out an island's impact assessment for the strategic plan, and we, um, you know, we we would and we will carry out an island's impact assessment where 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 that is the right thing to do. But very often, what we're doing is advising government or advising parliament. And it is then for government, if it decides to do something uh, with that advice, to carry out the island's impact assessment. But it will be highly, clearly what William has just said, will be highly relevant to that impact assessment in certain circumstances. No question of that. Um, now, I'm looking for another yellow hand or another question or thought in the chat box. And if I don't see anything, I'm going to talk about housing. Does access come under the remit? So Heather, thank you. Thank you for that one. That's just come up in the chat box. That's from Heather Woodbridge. Heather, that's appreciated. Um, so at the moment, the government's advisor and parliament's advisor on access legislation is um, what, what I still call Scottish Natural Heritage, though it's not called that. It's called Nature Scott. Um, um, but whichever name you choose to give it, it is the government's advisor on, on, on access. Um, there was, of course, significant legislation on access in 2003, I think it was, 3, 4. Um, there are still wrinkles in, in the implementation of that, but it, it, it has made a big difference in Scotland. Um, and no question, Scotland is now significantly different from the rest of the UK as regards access legislation. And David, I wonder if we could talk about housing, if that's OK, um, pending other points coming up from um, participants. Because housing, affordable housing is a big issue on, uh, on Orkney. Um, second homes are a big issue on Orkney. And there's, I'm aware of a number of development trusts that are actually doing some pretty remarkable things in Orkney to try and develop their own affordable housing. But that's, that's a slow and a difficult business. I'm also aware of conversation right around Scotland and in Wales, for example, about second homes and whether we can, uh, there are tools we could use, including taxation tools to discourage second homes. I wonder if you could just explore some, you know, a few thoughts that, that, that people might find helpful around the whole issue of, of housing in Orkney, David. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, I, I, I think there's often quite a bit of confusion around our role in relation to housing, <clears throat> because as, um, as Megan said in this introduction, we, we are the Land Commission and not the Planning Commission. Um, and I, I, in, in many places in Scotland, I know it's the case in Orkney that, that, that there is concern um, as to whether uh, planning regulations, planning policy inhibits new housing. It, it, it's not really the role of the Land Commission to determine what the planning policy should be uh, of the local authority, of the local council. But there's a whole different dimension that actually is equally important and is a constraint on why um, houses don't get built, particularly in rural areas, but, but also in, in, in urban areas as well, which is um, that the person who owns the land is not particularly cooperative in, in, in making the land available, not making the land available for rapid development where it happens to be. So the focus of what we've done is, is to look at the relationship between um, the owner of land, the uh, potential developer, um, and where the houses get built. Um, and it's clear from uh, research we've commissioned, uh, from what we've done ourselves, um, that from time to time there is a real problem that even if uh, planning permission were to be granted by local authority, the, the land wouldn't necessarily come forward for development. So that relates to um, a whole series of recommendations that, that Megan alluded to earlier on. And I think one of the, uh, one of the important ones in that report was for uh, a new Scottish land agency, which is different for the Commission because we're really a research and almost a think tank, think tank type of body. Uh, an agency would be there to facilitate the transfer of land um, from those who perhaps have held it in the past to those who want to build on it. Um, and in, in, in rural areas or in islands, I mean, that might be down to actually facilitating the transfer of individual plots of land. Um, in, in urban Scotland, it might be the facilitating the transfer of, of large areas. So I guess we see um, the relationship between housing and land and land ownership to be equally important as the relationship between housing and planning. Um, actually, the two interact, but uh, I think that the point I want to make is um, we're not here to tell the local planning authority how to set out their planning policy. That's not our job. Our job is uh, to ensure that, um, that where it is considered appropriate for, for development to take place, that that, that that development does actually take place and it's not in any way constrained by um, the inability to bring the land forward. I think that's probably enough said at the moment, but other people might want to come forward with that and, and, and other questions and so on and so forth. I think Megan, is Megan wanting to come in? Yeah, yeah. Uh, David, thank you very much indeed. Megan, just two seconds if you could hold. I just want to see if any if anyone, anyone, any participant would like to, to help us with thoughts on housing. And and I've just seen your comment in the chat. Thank, th th thanks. Um, uh, but but it, uh, I, I think I would find it very interesting. I think we would find it very interesting um, to, to get any feedback as to, I mean, is, no one's jumping up and down, which I don't think means there's, there's no problem about housing or not. Yeah, I mean, I, to, to, all, to the best of my knowledge, there is a shortage of affordable housing in Orkney and there is a second home issue on Orkney. Um, but I may be wrong. So please, please tell me, does anyone want to contribute? No hands going up. Okay. Oh, there's William. William, tell tell us, please. Great. Just because I've opened opened my mouth, so another another tap won't stop. <laughs> um, well, yeah, it's, th th this one's not really for me, but there's a lot of lot of friends that I have who are in the kind of younger category, and yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right that um, uh, house prices in Orkney are are astronomical. I think it's the same it's the same problems and the same instigating effects that you're seeing all around the UK. Um, you know, quite you know, exacerbated in Orkney because it's such a there's such a small supply houses for folk. Um, so 
um, you know, on on behalf of a lot of people that I know, yeah, absolutely, it's a it's a it's a major problem. Um, one of the big problems is being able to um, uh, 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 carry out a planning application and build a build a new house. There's lots of constraints around having things that are within the vernacular tradition that um, mean that people can't afford to do the developments. But then there's also a lot of restrictions on um, urbanisation um, of the of the countryside. So a lot of those things that you know I can kind of see the point of the planning department. Um, but these things are holding um, holding a lot a lot of developments back, and I know that you said that that's not it's not within your remit, but that that's a that, that's a major effect. And another one is uh, you know second homes um, and you know kind of uh, you know various other impacts that you get from you know uh, imbalanced demographic um, and huge number of other effects. Well, yeah, thanks. So, so I, I mean, I'm I'm certainly aware of of, of a case in Chapman, say, where planning requirements made it very difficult to develop housing. So that's that's useful to get your feedback. Um, and, and there's some there's Fiona again. Thanks, Fiona. Um, so I'm interested in 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 the, the I mean the planning issue is is, is clearly an issue. Uh, whether land is being brought forward, but then planning is not being consented, is that the problem? Um, uh, and also, uh, so Fiona's saying there's a huge number of vacant stroke derelict homes. Does that mean derelict in the sense of falling down or derelict in the sense of second homes? I'm not sure, Fiona, maybe you could help. Um, because one of the things we are working on and we'll publish later the year, in this year is a review of taxation, certain aspects of taxation. And, and, and uh, you may be aware, but, 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 but in Wales, for example, they're trialling, doubling the community the council tax on second homes difficult thing to do megan you were wanting in so why don't you come in on this issue it's a really important issue and certainly if you live in apple cross it's kind of you've got the scars so over to you megan <laughs> well yeah i mean apple cross is a is another very very sparsely populated rural remote rural area where we also i mean the the, the local community here has a huge problem of lack of availability of affordable homes for local communities plus we have about half of our of our housing stock currently either being short-term lets or second homes so very much understand the challenges what i wanted to reflect on was firstly just going kind of adding on to what david said in terms of our work on housing um we we we, we commissioned savills to do a review of the, the the various different issues relating to the the lack of availability of land for housing and the problems associated with affordable housing in remote rural areas and they included this the case study in Chapinsay that um, Andrew already referred to and in addition to the, the problems around the planning system not being sympathetic enough for for uh, the rural um, and island housing needs the other the other major conclusion was the fact that in these areas, the large scale housing developers are not interested in, in bringing forward development projects for housing in these kind of areas because the, 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 the scale doesn't work for them financially and infrastructure costs are too much. And as a result, it's, it's left to local community development trusts and local housing trusts to be providing that, that housing. So quite a lot of the recommendations we've been making have been around what kind of support community development trust and other local groups need to be able to be to make the, the, the bringing forward of affordable housing by community groups easier. And I know myself how difficult that is because the Apple Cross Community Development Trust is also trying to build affordable homes, homes themselves. And it's, an, it's a very difficult process to go through if you're not a housing developer or, or you know, for a community group, that's a huge challenge. So there were definitely recommendations in our work that related to the need for community groups who are providing affordable housing in remote rural areas to be given more support and for the planning system to be more sympathetic to that. I also just wanted to sort of refer to all the other things that are happening at the moment within the Scottish Government around the consultations on measures to tackle short term lets and second homes. We've got the licensing that's under consultation. We've got the control area regulations, both of which will potentially empower local authorities at the local authority level to be able to restrict the licenses on short term let, restrict the kind of the number of second homes. Um, not and not to 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 uh, in, in introduce restrictions when a second home is sold on the open market 
that 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 house does not automatically be, get to be a second home or a short term that subsequently. So I think that although these are not things that the land commission are directly actually working on at the moment, these are all things which we are hopeful will help to start to address the disproportionate imbalance between the numbers of second home and short term lets in areas where there's a massive need for, for affordable housing, particularly for young people. And I hope that the next time we hold an Orkney a meeting in the Orkney Islands, we're able to hear a more positive story about about some of these things because they are absolutely um, a real crisis across various different remote rural areas in Scotland. And and also we can see the same thing with happening with Airbnb lets in in you know highly desirable areas of Edinburgh and things like that. So I think it's definitely something which everyone recognises is an urgent issue. And hopefully the measures underway will will help to start tackling them. Thanks, Megan. So, uh, Danny, Fiona, uh, um, uh, and Anne, thank you for comments coming now in the chat. That's really helpful. So, just just uh, so to deal with the short term let point, um, Megan's just referred to. The government is is trying to pilot ways of dealing with it. It's an issue right across the, the country. The council tax issue is one where um, a number of people are thinking about it, including ourselves. It is interesting what's happening in Wales, where they're trialling doubling the council tax on second homes the problem is that these taxes are rather easy to evade you just put the the, the, the house into, into your daughter's name or something and, and and you get around it so they're challenging um the third issue that i'm really interested in there that fiona flagged i've lost now it's further up the chat was was buildings that are a bit, that are derelict that are allowing to fall down um now that's that is really interesting and i'm going to come to david because we we did some work actually quite early, David, on compulsory sale orders and how could we where 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 land or property is 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 essentially being just allowed to to become vacant and derelict. That that's not in the, the public interest and not in the national interest, and that the owners could potentially be forced to sell it. Do you want to say a bit about that and and, and anything else you want to add? David, David's thought about this far more than I have, David. Well, I was going to just make reference to um, the very detailed report in the Scottish Parliament Committee on Empty Homes, which I think was 2019. Um, I think a lot of local authorities made representations to that committee. I'm not too sure whether the Orkney Islands Council did so or not, um, but the gist of many representations um, was the need for compulsory sale powers for homes that are left empty, which, um, as we've indicated, was one of the early recommendations of the Land Commission. Um, and I was really quite pleased to see that the, uh, the conclusion of the parliamentary, the all part of parliamentary committee, um, was to encourage the Scottish government to move ahead with that legislation. Um, it wasn't undertaken the last parliament, primarily because of the, the bulk of other legislation with, with the, said with Brexit, but there, there is a commitment from the government uh, to take that legislation forward and um, give local authorities the powers, the compulsory sale order powers, uh, to deal with empty homes much more strongly. I think actually if, um, if the building is not simply empty but, but, but run down and derelict, I see no reason why the legislation could not be drafted in a way to deal with that as well. So, um, and, I, and I think there's widespread uh, consensus across all those involved um, with the empty homes campaign in Scotland. There's, I think there's about 40,000 empty homes across Scotland, which is a huge number. Um, and we really do need to tackle it more strongly. Uh, so hopefully what the Commission has recommended um, will come forward into legislation and will then it will then be for each local authority, obviously, to decide whether to put it into practice. But that is a democratic decision at local authority level, and that's for people to to vote in their elections uh, as they so wish. Um, so hopefully that will be a, a very useful addition to the battery of powers to deal with empty and, and, and derelict homes. Thanks, Andrew. David, thanks. So just just in, in case anyone hasn't fully picked up what a compulsory sale order is, the, the, the advice is on our website. But essentially, what we advised uh, the advice we gave to Parliament and the government was that a useful tool, which doesn't currently exist, would be to allow local authorities, if they so wished, and it'd be a matter for local democracy to decide, 
that they would have the powers to force the owner of a direct building to put it on the market uh, and, and for it to be sold at auction. And then, and then the likelihood is that it would be bought by someone who would do something with it. So um, th that was the recommendation in a nutshell, but the, the full details are available on the website. If Posey can find it, she'll put a link up. But um, okay, we've probably just about covered housing. I do want to move on, Doc, spend the whole time on, on um, but, um, so, sorry, I'm just reading this thing from Andrew Harvey. Yeah, I don't think anyone's to, 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 talking about forcibly taking land at a reduced value to the best of my knowledge, but I may have, I don't know where you've picked that one up. Um, I, I think that would be highly unlikely. I, think, I mean, I don't, um, yeah, hi, highly, I mean, I think it's highly unlikely that, that, that any public authority could take land at a reduced value forcibly. I, I, I don't see that. I think if, if I might just come in there. And yeah, David. The was that a number of people had made representations of the commission that we should do just that. The commission has not gone with those recommendations. We have not um, proposed to the government that land, if it is acquired by an agency, it should not be at what, what, what Andrew says is a, an extremely reduced value, even though other people are arguing for that. So that's not the commission's position. David, thanks. I'm sorry I hadn't got that. And there's the link to the compulsory sale as, as advice. Andrew, thanks. I'm sorry. I think it's a, a, there must be something. Maybe you could email us. Uh, if there's something on the website that mis misleads people, we need to correct that. Thanks, Andrew. Um, let, let's move on because there are other things uh, that, we, that I, I, I would like to cover. Now, one of the things that's been in the press a lot is this whole business of natural capital and carbon and carbon capture and carbon credits and all that sort of thing. Um, it, it's, the NFUS ha, has had a lot to say about it. Uh, I've gone on the record on a number of occasions just urging a bit of caution here. It's very, very early days, but what is clear already is that land prices are being forced up by people who are buying land with a view to then using that land to capture carbon through forestry or peatland restoration or a whole heap of other things, um, uh, and then sell carbon credits. Uh, and then of course, there are also the more, the things we're already seeing, which is land, land changing hands in order to build, build wind tur turbines to generate renewable energy, or uh, uh, not so much in Orkney, but elsewhere, run of river turbines as well. So there's a whole subject area in there uh, where we've just started doing some work. Megan, do you just want to, or, or Gemma, I'm not sure who I said, Gemma, I'm conscious that I haven't passed something to you for a second or two, so maybe I should go to you first, but just let's start with Gemma and then Megan. Just, just it's early days and, we, and, and, and it's, we've got some way to go on this, but it's very clear. Um, that the whole business of managing land to capture carbon is going to be important. And already speculators are coming in and buying farms and buying land with a view to, to, to being able to, 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 to make money through capturing carbon. Do you want to say just a, a wee bit about that work? Gemma, you, you can't preempt our conclusions because we don't know what there will be. <laughs> but let's say a wee bit about that and then I'll turn to Megan. Yeah, like you say, Andrew, it's it is at the very early stages, but um, we we are um, very conscious, really, in a lot of aspects of the need for um, for for benefits that come from land to be shared with the community. And um, you know, we we work quite closely with um, with a lot of land agents, and we have heard from them that it is a ma massive driver for sales at the moment. Is is people seeing an opportunity? Um, to benefit in the future from owning that um, and yeah I can I can certainly see that there's a need um, yeah for, for communities to have that it, it's like our work on um, land value sharing where there is there can be an uplift in value um, because of public investment something like infrastructure or planning permission can increase the value of land and, and I think you know we think that it's right that that increase should benefit everyone it should be for public benefit not just for private gain yeah well, thanks megan any thoughts from you on this one um thanks andrew um yes well uh i mean well firstly i'm i'm chairing a panel session on this exact topic uh next week as part of our um biennial land 
conference. So if anyone wants to hear a bit more about this in more detail, um, then please, uh, I think Posey will probably show the link in a minute. We've um, just expanded the capacity of that particular panel. So come along and listen to um, what we're trying to do within that panel is, is yeah, think about what are the real, what are the real models for improved sharing of the benefits and the costs of that might result from this increase in interest in, in natural capital relating to land what are the kind of risks that will accompany that and, and where could the Commission's work really sort of focus on in the future on that. Um, what, is, what is clear is that there is, as, as with all these kind of boom and bust cycles in terms of natural resource, the sort of the focus of the new natural resource extraction potential, um, the market operates ahead of policies and regulations. So one of the things we're trying to understand at the moment is exactly how that market is operating. What are the actual changes in land value? What kind of, where is investment being focused? We're trying to understand to what extent are, you know, we, we've heard from a number of different crofting and crofting grazing committees that they're being approached by investors who are wanting to buy the potential to sequester carbon. From them, they're being offered, you know, contracts and things like that. It would be really interesting to hear whether Farmers in, in the Orkney Islands are also being approached by by people wanting to sign contracts around, you know, the the sort of the the, the carbon sequestration capacity of of farmland. There, um, fundamentally, what's at the heart of the Land Commission's work at the moment is 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 two things. One is trying to understand what the actual situation on the ground is. So we always start: what is the evidence? How is the land value changing? How is that impacting people on the ground in terms of changes in land ownership? And then, second, as Gemma said how can we make sure that this opportunity that has come out of our response to the climate emergency and meeting the net zero target how can we make sure that 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 opportunity can be fairly shared across across everyone and that the costs are fairly shared as well because we the scottish government has made a commitment towards a just a just transition in terms of the response to the climate emergency and that does mean that everyone needs to be taken forward in terms of that transition and that you know, communities in certain areas of Scotland or certain types of communities are not paying a greater cost than others. So that's really at the heart of our thinking. But as I said, we're going to be having a, a panel session next week on Monday at 1.30. Um, if you're interested to come and listen to um, me talking a bit more about this and, and lots of other interesting people talking about it as well. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. So I'm looking to see if anyone wants to say anything, raise a hand or, or type into the chat. Particularly if you're a farmer or a landowner, is this is this an issue? We know, for example, I mean, I live in Inverness, large chunk of land south of Inverness, bought by um, Brewdog, a big brewer, um, for the purposes of sequestering carbon in order to be able to sell their beer as carbon neutral. Uh, another large chunk of land, um, but south of Elgin, sold to a big insurance company uh, in order to sequester carbon so that they can um, say that they're carbon neutral. And we know, also I was talking in fact to our common grazing clerk in the Western Isles just a couple of weeks ago, who'd been approached completely out of the blue by a speculator wanting to buy the rights to carbon capture on the common grazings. So this is happening now, and I'd be interested to know if it's happening in Orkney. You may not want to tell us, of course, you may be in the middle of a negotiation, but <laughs> um, no, nobody volunteering on that one. Here we are. There's one from William, we're back on housing again. William, I'll come back, back to housing if there's time at the end. I just want to make sure we've covered the other things, if that's all right. Okay, uh, well, we'll leave, we'll leave the carbon capture thing, but it, it is a real issue, uh, particularly for farmers. Um, there is very little question that it's going to be a real issue. The NFUS are very exercised about it. Um, let's talk about community ownership. Um, there, there's... Uh, quite a number of development trusts in the Oakland Islands, um, quite a lot of uh, activity, uh, community ownership of land, but community ownership of buildings as well, development of community owned housing and so on. Um, we've, we've, we've done quite a lot of thinking about, um, about this. It's not the answer to everything quite clearly. It's, it's, it's part of a mix of private and public and third sector and community ownership. Um, but it does have a really valuable place uh, and, and where you've got an energetic and empowered community, you can do some pretty remarkable things. Gemma, did you just want to maybe just offer some examples of, not, I mean, maybe from, 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 from the US, from your own experience there, of, of, of what community ownership has done elsewhere that, that people might find interesting. And then I'm going to see 
what thoughts people may want to offer. I don't know if there's anyone in, in, in the meeting who's, who's involved in community ownership in Orkney, but we'll see you in a second. But why don't you kick it off, Gemma? Okay, sure. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm from South East. It's the largest community-owned estate in Scotland. Um, we bought out the island in 2006 on St Andrew's Day. Um, I think it's fair to say, I, think I was 19 when, when the buyout went ahead, but I mean, at that point, I, if the owners of the island had walked in to the shop when I was there, I wouldn't have been able to pick them out. I wouldn't have known it was them. Um, they did come up for, for um, I think, a lot of shooting and fishing and things that I, I wasn't really involved in. <laughs> um, but since, since the island's been bought out, you know, it, it's not... Um, it's it's not all community ownership isn't always the right situation and um, depending on on what you're doing but since um since use was bought out there has been a massive amount of investment and development and things have happened that we we definitely wouldn't have seen under private ownership um you know there, there's turbine developments there's um been investment in the harbor um in my local village um and there there is kind of level of democratic participation that wasn't there before so there's there's an election every year people get to have a say in in who's making decisions and um, they're actually currently looking for nominations for the board for, for this year's round of elections um, and it's something I, I I've worked in prior to coming to the commission um, I worked on the Scottish Land Fund um, and that included it kind of across the Highlands and Islands including Orkney um, so um, there are loads of fantastic examples of communities, you know, saving their local shops, delivering housing, uh, creating community space and amenities. Um, and it's it's something that, you know, can be really empowering and really give the community to see um, over what happens and to give them a bit of control over the local economy. Um, and it ties into some work where we're developing some guidance on community wealth building at the moment and, and community ownership of, of assets and of the economy and of local wealth is a really important aspect of that. Um, and I think someone mentioned earlier that, um, you know, communities own a lot of the land in Orkney anyway, that community ownership is part of that. And I think that, you know, we've got that in common in the Western Isles. Um, and it is it's something we're, we're looking at how support for that goes on. Obviously, I've mentioned I worked on the land fund, but we're looking at other funding options. We're looking at options to complement the land fund, other ways of, of getting um, a bit of funding in, different kinds of investment that can support communities to purchase assets. Um, we think it's, you know, it, it's going to be an ongoing um, thing in Scotland. We're going to continue to see communities um, purchasing land. There, there's a lot of interest across the country and that's expanded into urban areas in the last four and a half years. Um, so, you know, we, we've done research on it. It's something we support and we have spoken to a lot of communities who, um, who own land or who are interested in owning land. And um, yeah, happy to answer any questions you have, really. Gemma, yeah, thanks. Uh, just just an aside, Anne and Peter, thanks for your comments about farming. Yes, I've been point taken about it's a new question that, that um, you know, um, managing grazings in a particular way can sequester a lot of carbon. Um, I just want to continue on this community ownership theme, recognising that you're totally different. Orkney doesn't have that kind of land ownership structure. But what we have got on, on Orkney is quite a lot of development trusts on, on, on Sandy and North Donaldson and Bursley and so on. Um, that are doing quite important things. So I would value if anyone wants to contribute thoughts on, on that. Um, how is it working? Are you being able, able to access the investment capital you need? Anyone got any experience of community share issues, those sorts of things? If not, we'll, 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 we'll move on. But um, here's one from Heather. Heather, thank you. Yes, so this is an issue, very interestingly, we've come from almost nowhere on community owned housing to a lot of a lot of development trusts trying to do it. And um, raising the funding, certainly from public sources, is very difficult. And what's happening is a lot of development trusts around Scotland are trying, are now raising it from philanthropic and charitable sources, um, some with remarkable success. Um, Gemma, do you want to say a wee bit more about, so we, we, we've been doing, doing work on, on 
you know, there is the land fund, but we must be careful not to rely on the taxpayer for this sort of stuff. And we've done a lot of thinking about other ways of raising capital, philanthropic community shares, all these sorts of things. Gemma, do you want to say a wee bit more about that, please? Yeah, sure. Um, we're, we're currently working uh, with some consultants exploring um, the different kinds of options they are. Um, Andrew's mentioned philanthropic funding. Um, we're looking at things like community shares issues, um, private investment. Um, yeah, it just the, it's um, work that's building on a report that we published um, a couple of years ago now looking at uh, funding options. So we have that report and we've got a table of the different funding options available on our website, but we're looking at building on that and uh, we're going to make recommendations to the Scottish Government on, on those kind of uh, funding options to complement the land fund, um, really looking at that kind of medium to long term and what they can do to, to further support that. Um, so there's some interesting ideas coming out of it. We've been working on it for probably about the past six weeks and we're hoping to have something published probably into early next year on that. Thanks Gemma, so if anyone has an interest in that either contribute now or by all means contact us later. Um, here's one from William again. William, would the Commission recommend as a way to protect non-absentee landowners well, no, I mean, the point of the compulsory sale order wasn't about whether you're an absentee or not. The point of the compulsory sale order was simply to say, if you own a land or buildings which, which is just lying derelict and is, is doing nothing useful, then, it's, then that's not in the public interest. Uh, and therefore, the local authority, which is the democratically accountable body, should have the power to say, look, if you're just going to let, let that lie derelict, then uh, we're going to make you sell it at auction, so you'll get fair value. Um, so that somebody else can use it. That, that, that's the point of the compulsory sale order. It's not about whether someone's an absentee or not. William, do you want to come back? I, I can't see William's thing now. But... Uh, yeah, I can come back. Yeah, no, I, 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 yeah, I totally agree. Um, and, you know, I think in that situation where it's vacant and derelict and, you know, sitting beside the tune and it's not done anything for 30 years, that, that's an absolutely, um, you know, kind of right application. But I think the thing that a lot of... Um, you know, f farmers and landlords in Orkney get get kind of heat up about is say if they have a you know fair little bit of ground and you know they're they're farming it to the the best of their ability and it's you know it's providing for them and their family. You know, does does that come within the in in the sites of this compulsory sale order or does it or is it totally separate? Yeah. Okay. Understood. So let's be very clear about this. And, and uh, uh, sorry. Posey, I'm not sure if you put the link up, but it's, if you if you have, thanks. Can I just come in, Andrew? Yes, um, David. David no, it you... doesn't, because the compulsory sale order uh, applies to previously used vacant, derelict land. It does not apply to agricultural land. That was, that was very clear in the report. Thanks, David. Yeah, it, it, it was very clear. And in fact, we, we were clear that we were talking about land that is on the vacant and derelict land register. So Philip Kemp's point, so it's an interesting, it is an interesting question. This comes up at a lot of public meetings. Is land that's being managed for, you know, for nature conservation, is that derelict? And in some people's eyes, if you're a farmer, perhaps it is derelict. In other people's eyes, it isn't. But that is a productive use. The production of biodiversity is, is a productive use. And, and, and we could argue about that probably for the rest of the evening if we wanted to. Um, the... the the, the point, the, the vacant and derelict land register is where local authorities uh, say, look, this piece of land or this building is vacant and derelict. It's, 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 it's no use. It's a blight on the place. It's, 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 it's not in the public interest. And, and we would then, the, the, the compulsory sale order, they would then have the opportunity to use the sale order if government legislates. But as yet, of course, it's just a recommendation from us. Gemma, you've got your hand up. Do you want to come back in? Yeah, it was just to come in on that point um, and say that um, our, our good stewardship protocol in, in line with the land rights and responsibility statement um, does say that where, where land um, is highly suitable for a primary use, so for example food production or flood management or um, water catchment management, then that value should absolutely be recognised in decision making. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not about saying that, you know, land shouldn't be used 
for farming it should be used for trees instead it's absolutely not about that if there is a particular value for that land then that, that should be recognized and indeed you know managing land um for nature and biodiversity reasons is you know it, it's not something i think we would consider uh, derelict at all it productive use isn't just you know, something industrial or a building or something very visible, it, it, you know, it might look like there's not a lot going on, but in actual fact, um, it could be, a, you know, a really positive outcome that's coming from the way the land has been managed. Emma, thank you. I'm interested, Philip, that you raise it, and I don't know whether you want to speak further, because uh, I'm also aware from Facebook traffic that I was watching that, that there was some question about whether historic environments, Scotland's ownership of land was also holding back um, the economy. Um, now I don't know, you know, I, I understand that I, I understand the issue because it's an issue in many other parts of Scotland. I also understand the point that HES uh, have a significant role in Orkney. I also understand perfectly well that RSVP are a big landowner in Orkney. It would be helpful, I don't know what Philip, I'm sorry, I'm looking for your name on the thing whether you want to contribute further on that or if anyone else wants to offer a thought on, on these big public and charitable landowners and, and, and whether you find that, you know, you know, are they positive or neutral or, or, or are there issues? Interested in feedback, if anyone wants to offer something or just type it in if you want. No hands going up. No, okay, well, we'll let that one go then. Um, no, no volunteers. Megan, back to you. Um, maybe while someone is mulling over a response to that question, I think it's worth reiterating that the land rights and responsibilities statement and the government guidance on engaging with communities around land use decision making applies to every different type of landowner, including Historic Environment Scotland, including landowning, landowning land that is owned by NGOs such as the RSPB. So there is um, the expectations on responsible land ownership and stewardship. And when I'm talking about responsible, I'm talking here in terms of the need to engage with local communities, the need to involve local communities in decision-making around land is a, a, you know, a responsibility for all landowners. It's not just something that we're focusing on in terms of private landowners or public landowners, because I think that that's, we sort of sometimes Sometimes the assumption is that these kind of policies are param primarily designed for private land ownership, and that absolutely is not the case. And there's um, there's some very good examples of um, land ownership being done by, you know, by NGOs, which in the past hadn't had a very good track record in terms of developing good relationships with local communities, but have really made a big effort in in in, in transforming that relationship, and are actually now really leading the way in terms of demonstrating leadership and how important engaging with local communities and involving local communities in, in at, at a management level, in a, at a consultative level and at an engagement level is what, what a transformative impact that can have, not just in terms of mending that relationship, but also in terms of what the, the NGO landowner is trying to, trying to achieve on the ground with their piece of land as well. Megan, thanks. Okay, for the last few minutes, and I'm going to go back to the housing question because there, there are obviously a number of things. So William, um, so William was asking the question, and it's a question we're often asked, and I, I think it's worth just reflecting on it. Could we, would it be possible, I'm paraphrasing William, forgive me, would it be possible to restrict uh, the housing market to local buyers in some way, perhaps for a fixed period? Um, what would happen? Um, you know, would that, would that mean that local people then got a chance to buy things at a, at a fair price, or would it just mean that nobody would sell anything, um, or would it result in local people buying up houses cheap in, in order to sell them on six months later at a higher price on an open market? Or what would happen? Or would is there a way of of perhaps having some houses only available to locals and others available for second homes, that sort of stuff? Um, Charlie, are you wanting to come in? Charlie, you, yeah, you, you need to unmute yourself, please. Sorry on that. Uh, I'm a great believer in the carrot rather than the stick. <laughs> and 
the the one thing that could you know, incentivize local purchasing is no capital gains tax on a transfer to someone local as opposed to a second homeowner. And it's a very easy and practical way of policing the system. And uh, I don't see that that's insurmountable. It, it may be open to abuse, but I wouldn't have thought so. That's a really interesting idea, Charlie. Thank you. Um, we are doing a piece of work on tax. Um, capital gains tax is, is, is not devolved. It's, it's managed from Westminster, but we're not afraid to offer advice to Westminster as well. Um, and we will do. So, yeah, thank you. We, 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 we'll be publishing that later in the year. Um, th there are other taxes, uh, property taxes, that we are thinking quite hard about, uh, land and buildings transaction tax, for example. Um, but all the, I mean, the, tax is an incredibly difficult subject because, first of all, because of unforeseen consequences, and secondly, because of, of tax avoidance and evasion. Um, I'm just going to come to you, David, if I may, on on, on the, the the picking up William's point about or this William Annals point about you know could we restrict the market in some way? Just a, a general thought on that because you know one hears it a lot. Could, are there ways in which we could you know ring fence some houses for local people only and that sort of thing? Uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, thanks, Andrew. I mean, I think. There is a distinction between newly built housing and, and, and existing housing. I mean, local authorities have uh, quite wide experience and powers through uh, Section 75 agreements um, in managing the occupancy of, of, of new housing in, in pressured locations. Um, and there are powers that, uh, certainly under new housing, the, the uh, the council could seek to pursue if it so wished, and, and maybe it does on occasions. Um, maybe it does in a way that, that, that may be unhelpful. So, for example, I've, I've seen quite a bit of traffic on the way in which uh, the, the local authority restricts the occupancy of, of new, new, new houses on, on farms in, in a very tight way. The, the difference, obviously, is from that um, to the existing housing market and um, transactions in the open market between the existing seller and uh, a purchaser. I think there's um, there's all kinds of practicalities that probably make that quite a hard thing to do. Um, and most of the effort is, most of the thought has been around, um, as has been said, the tax incentives or the tax disincentives um, that might reduce the uh, the likelihood of, of, of homes being turned into second homes. So um, it, it's really the existing market that's much harder to do that kind of thing than, than, than new development. I think that's the, the gist of the, uh, the issue. And we are exploring it in relation to some of the tax work, but we shouldn't necessarily presume we will come up with a, a golden bullet on it. David, thank you. It is a fantastically difficult issue, William, and thanks for raising it again. Um, and, you know, we'll continue to work on it. I, there are no easy answers. I, I've been involved working on this for, for 15, 20 years. I used to chair one of the National Park Authorities where second homes are a huge problem. Um, it is incredibly difficult to find something that's not, people can't get round. And it also, one has to recognise that that for every house buyer, there's a house seller. And if you limit who they can sell it to, you've reduced the price they'll get for it. So the, you know, that's the other side of the equation. Um, now, there were just a couple of more things coming up. I'm conscious of the time. Fiona, thanks. Um, I'm not familiar with who owns the Ring of Brodgar at the moment. So forgive me, I'd need to understand that. Um, it, it might be one of these cases where community ownership, if people already consider it, it is, it is theirs, community ownership might be a good route. And that has certainly been done elsewhere, but I'm sorry, I just, I'm not familiar with who owns it. Um, forgive me. Um, new government, yeah, new, new governments. Um, uh, Eleanor, thanks. The, the new governance thing, let's just touch on that, because I think that is quite interesting. 
Um, and then I'll come to John. John Files want to get his hand up. Um, so just very briefly, um, well, maybe I'll just deal with that because of time, if that's all right um, to the others. So what we're thinking about is that in, in Scotland and in the UK, we, as Megan said earlier, it tends to be it's either privately owned or publicly owned or a charity owns it, but somebody owns it. The idea of shared ownership um, uh, uh, in some way or another is, is relatively rare in this country, though commonplace in many other parts of Europe where different rights are owned by different people. The nearest example I can give you from in Scotland is that in a crofting, for example, in a coving, common grazings, the right to graze may well be owned by the crofters, the right to do many other things owned by the landowner, the right to take fish may be owned by somebody else completely, fishing rights may be owned by someone completely. That kind of shared thing happens a little bit in Scotland, but there may well be, and we're working on this, there may well be new models where different rights could be more shared. So, so different, different interest groups, if you like, would, would share, would, would own different bits of rights in land. Uh, and that might be a way, a way forward in certain circumstances. Um, and, and Megan's just flagging up that there will be uh, a session on that in the, in the, in the conference. Uh, now, John, conscious of time running out. John, you've got your hand up. John File. Yes. Sorry, Andrew. Can you hear me okay? Yes, got you. Yeah, no, I was trying to post on a link there about uh, the stoke boxes so people were aware if, if they weren't uh, listening on. Uh, I'm very conscious I don't have an Arcadian accent, but I've been asked by three or four farmers to live on tonight because I've been representing a few up there that were very concerned uh, lately the way they've been treated with the uh, geese and things like that. So that's led to a fight back against uh, the capture of the stoats. Um, will land reform, this is not a comment on RSPB land ownership, but it is on potential access. There's a couple of issues. There's, there's RSPB access at the moment for stoke boxes, which has been rebuked by many farmers uh, at the moment. Uh, and they actually thought they had a, a right. There was letters went out saying there was a right to access farms, which was wrong. Uh, and also on the Islands Council are, are looking for more access to land around areas where there's pressure caused by the cruise ships. Now, both, both of these examples have significant benefits uh, to the ambitions of both those organizations. But to some of the community there that have been there a long time, the, there is no real benefit and they're seeing uh, potential threats to their property and their ways of managing their property. Is there any danger that the, 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 the land reforms coming up will give more rights uh, and, and see a, a revisit to the access laws, as well as we've spoken a lot about ownership tonight, but will it give more power to community bodies who had already felt to perhaps not be acting in the best interests of the community. So there's certainly we are not anticipating doing any further work on access legislation, uh, and we're not we're not seen as being the government or parliament's advisor on access legislation. So I can't. I'm certainly not aware of, of uh, SNH and Nature Scott doing any further work on that either. So to the best of my knowledge, there's nothing in the pipeline on access legislation. The general thrust of land reform is, I think, to try and find a balance, a fair balance between private rights and public and the public interest. And it's a very difficult thing to do. And everybody has an opinion about where that balance should sit. And that balance moves over time as society evolves and takes a different view. And if you if you go back, you know you don't even have to go back a hundred years. There were, there were uh, you know very different circumstances. Um, so if you take the, the 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 issues that you're you're raising around stoats and geese, and I'm well aware of all the difficulties there. They're not really issues for us. Um, at, at the end of the day. Government has to try and find a fair balance between the private interest of the, the private landowner, the, proper, the, 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 the rights that go with property, property rights, if you like, and a legitimate societal interest uh, more generally. And, and that's not an easy thing, but that's, that, that's, that's what, what land reform will, will continue to try and do in all sorts of different ways. Um, not if that answers you, John, but it's probably the nearest I can get. Um, conscious that it's 8.30 and I said we would finish at 8.30, so I'm going to. Um, so just a couple of things before I do that. First of all, there is an email address which Posey's put up once already, but maybe you could put it up again, Posey. Um, 
please feel free to uh, email us if you've got thoughts, observations, or questions. Or if you want to have a chat with me, because normally in a public meeting afterwards, I hang about and have private chats with people who want to say things they wouldn't, didn't want to say in public. So if you want to speak to me, email in on that email address that's now up in the chat, and I'll give you a ring. Um, and, and I make that commitment, because I think it's important that you have access to me if you want it. You may not want it. And secondly, could you please um, fill in the smart survey link, which is also there, because it helps us greatly to, to improve these sessions. We're, we're learning as much as anybody how to do public meetings online. It's not easy. So feedback, please. Otherwise, thank you all very much for participating. Uh, I do think that's been enormously helpful, uh, not least because Orkney is different. And there's no doubt about that. Scotland's diverse, but Orkney is particularly different. And the issues that we, we, we've heard this evening are not the same as we would hear in other public meetings. So thank you all very much indeed. Big thank you to Gemma, to David and to Megan um, for uh, contributing in all sorts of different ways. Thank you for that. Thank you to everyone who asked a question. These things don't work if you don't ask questions and make observations. So thank you for that. Um, uh, and um, I'll look forward, to, hopefully, to the next public meeting, be, meeting in Orkney actually being on Orkney uh, and not over this, this machine, which is not my favourite way of integrating, <laughs> interacting with people. But for now, good night. Safe journey to your kitchen for a, a cocoa or whatever you're going to do. Good night, mm -hmm. all. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.